Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 19th annual presentation of the Fred Friendly First Amendment Award. I'm Lee Camlet, Dean of the School of Communications. And on behalf of President Leahy and the university, I want to thank all of you for joining with us to celebrate the great career and the great work of Martha Raddis, the senior foreign affairs correspondent for ABC News. <clears throat> I am proud to say that I am a card-carrying member of the Martha Raddatz Fan Club. Having had the privilege of working alongside her at ABC News, not to mention being among the millions of viewers and radio listeners and book readers who have benefited from the experience of her reporting. The catalog of her work exemplifies Fred Friendly's journalistic, journalistic ideals. You can count on Martha to be fair, factual, and fearless. Let me introduce the other guests at Martha's table. Ruth Friendly, Fred's widow and vice president and senior editorial director of Fred Friendly Seminars. <clears throat> Dr. John Leahy, president of Quinnipiac University. <clears throat> Diane Sawyer, anchor of ABC's World News. <clears throat> George Stephanopoulos, co-anchor of Good Morning America and anchor of This Week. <clears throat> Charles Gibson, the former anchor of ABC World News and co-anchor of Good Morning America, and a former Fred Friendly Award winner. Robin Sproul, Sproul, Vice President and Washington Bureau Chief of ABC News. And ABC News correspondent Barbara Walters, who is the co-creator and co-host of The View on ABC, will be joining us shortly. Allow me just a few words about the School of Communications. Like many of you, we're striving to keep pace at the rapidly changing world of communications. I'm happy to report at, that at Quinnipiac University, we're confronting the challenges of the dig digital age with enthusiasm and innovation, learning how to meet the demands of multiple platforms. Our journalism faculty is in the midst of a top to bottom review of the curriculum to make certain our students graduate with the multiple skills, the ethical standards, and the global perspective that you expect of them. To that end, I, in I intend to take advantage of the wealth of knowledge and experience in this room, so you can expect a call from me asking your advice about how we can continue to improve our program. We're keenly aware of the economic challenges facing the journalism industry. Our undergraduates have been teaming up with classmates from the Quinnipiac School of Business to take on the challenge of creating journalism ventures that are financially sustainable. Their ideas have routinely won top prize money in competition against other universities. At the graduate level, we're launching new degree programs in social and interactive media and sports journalism. So while some may be wringing their hands at the uncertain future of journalism, at Quinnipiac, our students are not only embracing it, they're designing it. And we're achieving results. Our alumni are your colleagues working in your newsrooms and control rooms, in your offices and on your web pages. And our current students are grateful to so many of you for being their mentors. We appreciate the outstanding internship opportunities you've made available to them. You don't need a special invitation. Please come visit us at the university and see what our faculty and our students are accomplishing. And it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Ruth Friendly who is the Vice President and Senior Editorial Director of the Fred Friendly Seminars. But that title doesn't begin to tell the story of what Ruth has done to carry on the work of her late husband, Fred. Ruth was a teacher in, Scarsdale, in the Scarsdale school system for 17 years. But in 1981, she joined Fred to work on his media and society seminars, helping to produce a landmark series for PBS, beginning with The Constitution, That Delicate Balance. She also produced dozens of non-televised programs, which Fred moderated. She continued that work after Fred retired, laying the foundation for what would ultimately become the Fred Friendly Seminars. Like her husband, Ruth brings to the table meticulous journalistic standards. In this dizzying world of tweets and blogs and talking heads, when ethical issues often get short shrift, 
Ruth says, not so fast. With the seminar, she says, we try to halt the stampede and provide a structure and catalyst to help people move beyond the sound bites and think more deeply. I submit that all of us could benefit from a little less speed and a little more time to stop and reflect. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Ruth Friendly. It's wonderful to see you all here, if I could see, but, <laughs> but I know you're out there, and, I, and welcome. Uh, and thanks so much to President John Leahy and Dean Camlet, uh, Lynn Bushnell, Carl and Natali, and your committed staff for making this wonderful 19th Fred Friendly First Amendment Award Luncheon. This year is especially important to me because remembering Fred by honoring Martha Raddatz, an extraordinary journalist, is especially meaningful because she is Fred's kind of journalist. At ABC, senior, far, senior foreign correspondent, she has spent more time in war zones than a host of her counterparts. Somehow, she manages to get places others don't because she wants to feel it and see it if she's going to report it. Born in Idaho, Martha grew up in Salt Lake City where she got her start as a reporter. Eager to spread her wings, she went back to Idaho where a local TV station turned her down. No insight there. Fortunately, an ABC affiliate in Boston recognized her talents and pulled her east to be their chief correspondent. My big break, says Martha. Not only did she get to cover presidential campaigns, but she was able to get around the world covering stories in Africa, the Middle East, the Soviet Union, you name it. Fred used to say that a journalist's job is to explain complicated issues but you can't explain them if you don't understand them. As a master sergeant in World War II, he wrote for CBI Roundup and covered the China-Burma-India uh, theater. Sent to Europe in 1944, he was at the Morthausen concentration camp at its liberation. He felt and saw that camp with its ovens and its starved dead, piled like cordwood, and he reported it. At CBS, Fred pushed to make Vietnam a living room war and vowed to have a piece on the air nightly. The bravery and the not so glorious witnessed the burning of village huts by American soldiers using cigarette lighters, the village being Comne. And televisional journalism then allowed the nation to feel and see a war in a way civilians had not experienced before. As I watch Martha Raddatz on air reporting from Yemen or Iraq or Afghanistan or Egypt, I realize how much Fred would have wanted her on his team. In 1999, after five years as the Pentagon correspondent for National Public Radio, Martha joined ABC Network News as their State Department correspondent with an office at the Pentagon. Her count counterpart from CBS News, David Martin, told me, when Martha came over to the Pentagon, she was not just going to cover the Pentagon, she was going to cover the war. Most of us cover the war as it's filtered through the Pentagon, not Martha. Iraq was getting worse and worse, and Martha just kept going back there. You make your own luck. She would end up over and over again being at the right place at the right time. Bush made a surprise visit. She was there. David marveled at her meteoric rise at ABC. She went from being Pentagon correspondent to White House correspondent in a flash. But that didn't change her modus operandi. 
She knew that to be a good White House reporter, to be able to ask the right questions, it was necessary to keep going to Iraq. Did I say Iran? I meant Iraq before. It was necessary to keep going back there. This was a controversial issue at ABC. If she's covering the White House, why does she need to go overseas? Her answer, when I ask questions about Fallujah, I want to have been there. She needed to know it from the ground up. As Fred said, you can't explain a complicated story if you don't understand it. Covering Iraq was mind-bending. Martha goes over there by herself. She embeds, but the only pe people she's with are the troops. She exposes herself to danger. Along with the troops, the generals also become her sources, and they trust and respect her. The fight in Sadr City in April 2004 was searing, heartrending, demanding insightful reporting, more than clips on the nightly news. You recall the 19 soldiers of that platoon trapped in an alley in Sadr City and the rescue team sent to save them. Martha knew them all from having been embedded with them in the past. There were soldiers there who had never been in battle, being led by soldiers who had never been in battle. The story of Sadr City took her breath away and it inspired her to write The Long Road Home, her book covering the battle the heroism under fire, the families of the troops and their sacrifices. Martha Braddatz not only gets the facts, she understands the nuances, the dilemmas, the contradictions, and she tells a gripping story. Tom Betag, another winner of this award, was executive producer of Nightline when Martha joined Network News. And he told me that some wondered if she was tough enough for the job. They didn't have to wait long to see. Nightline ran three half hours of her Sadder City story. As Tom said to her, we want everything you do. When I asked David Martin what words he would use to describe Martha aside from her repertorial skills, he thought for a moment, and then he said, fearless is the obvious one. And another is charming. Two attributes that don't, don't necessarily go together, but that's what makes her so effective. And that she is. Congratulations. We're honored to have you as our awardee, Martha Raditz. And Fred, I suspect, is smiling down to on you today. Thank you, and the podium is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Please. Thanks, thanks. You quit smiling. I'm going to. I am not fearless. I am absolutely filled with fear right now. <laughs> I truly am. I told Lee that I was so nervous about this, and I, I don't know why I just am so nervous about this, but then he told me other recipients, not you, Charlie, were nervous as well. I'm sure you aren't nervous at all. I, I just I have to say, I honestly can't believe my good fortune. I can't believe my name will be on the same roster, the jaw-dropping roster of previous recipients of the Fred Friendly Award not to mention to be among this room of champions and mentors and friends. I am 
truly thrilled when I look out at the faces here who I have so long admired. I am not surprised this group of people is here, however. All of you who are here have helped me from the very beginning, have supported me, have been there for me in any way you possibly can. And people like producer Ely Brown, who has been at my side in so many of these stories, thank you. Then again, this is probably the nicest place we've ever been together. <laughs> I thank Quinnipiac University, which has had astonishing growth, now ranking among the best, one of the best in the nation. President John Leahy can take much of the credit, and now with Dean Lee Camlet on the board, the university on board, the university is growing further in all the best ways possible. And who does not love a university and an award ceremony where they have a cocktail hour starting at 11 a.m.? <laughs> so I thank John Leahy, Lee Camlet, and especially Ruth Friendly for this honor. I met Fred exactly once when he came through the ABC affiliate in Boston, WCVB. I had worked there several years and was thrilled to meet him and was probably quite ridiculous when I introduced myself. I am sure that if Fred were alive today and you ask him about that day he met that young Boston journalist, he would have absolutely no memory of it. But I have not forgotten, and when this award was announced, I thought of that day and meeting Fred. Fred Friendly inspired a generation of journalists, and Ruth Friendly carries on that work. As you know, this award honors those who have shown courage and forthrightness in preserving our basic constitutional rights. Ruth's own courage and commitment are certainly award worthy. I still struggle when people ask me about or talk about what they perceive as my own courage. Have I been forthright? Yes. Courageous? I simply can't say that. The courageous ones are the people I have covered during my career. The families overseas who struggle through famine, disaster, loss, and war the targets of hatred, the victims of unimaginable cruelty, and yes, for more than a decade, the US military at war and the families they have left behind. I have met remarkable people over the years, some who I am decidedly not objective about. They do not call themselves courageous, so how can I possibly say that about myself? They give us hope. One of my favorite moments involving a quiet hero was not on the battlefields of Iraq or Afghanistan, but on the beaches of Normandy in 2010. I was on what is called an army staff ride, which is a battlefield tour, which, histori which historians lead. The group I was with was put together by a general named Carter Ham, who I had known from very early, very bad days in Iraq. General Ham would become the first senior officer to publicly acknowledge his own post-traumatic stress. On that day in Normandy, there were about a dozen soldiers and officers tagging along. They were all in civilian clothes as we made our way to the cemetery at Normandy in a steady rain. I stayed close to one young soldier. I knew why he was there and what it meant to him. He was quietly weeping as he stood before the rows and rows of white crosses, and so was I. When sunset approached, General Ham asked the young soldier to help him lower the massive flag that flies over those crosses. While General Ham and the young soldier had handled many flags in their lives, the officials of the cemetery came over to explain the particular protocol at Normandy. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a very elderly man approach. I now know he was a former Marine, close to 80 years old, stooped yet proud, he was wearing a cap that said Korean War Veteran. Despite his age, he apparently had no problem with his hearing. He had overheard the instructions being given to General Ham and the young soldier who looked more like a college kid in his khaki pants and plaid shirt. The elderly veteran walked boldly up and pointed a finger in indignation at the young man and said, don't you know how to fold a flag, young man? General Ham and the young soldier froze for just a moment and then General Ham said gently to the old veteran, Sir, I am General Carter Ham, and this young man is Staff Sergeant Salvatore Junta, whom the President has nominated as the first living Medal of Honor recipient since the Vietnam War. The elderly vet veteran let out an audible, whoa. 
then stood as straight as he could, faced Junta, and raised his hand in a salute. Junta returned the salute and said softly, it is you we should be thanking for your service. Sal Junta does not think he is courageous or a hero. He does not think he did anything that others wouldn't do in the same situation. Facing down the Taliban in an effort to rescue his wounded friend who the Taliban were trying to carry away. Junta managed to pull his fellow soldier to safety, but the friend later died from his wounds. I have not found a courageous soldier, marine, sailor, or airman who thinks they have done anything other that others wouldn't do, male or female. But we are a country tired of war after becoming far too accustomed to it. We have divided ourselves into two segments in, in society, those who have fought and those who have not. Yes, people say they support the troops, they hang yellow ribbons and stand at baseball games to honor them, but it does not go much beyond that. My own son is 20. For half his life, for half the lives of everyone his age, we have been at war. And yet the huge majority of young people, the huge majority of people all over the country have not been affected at all by these conflicts. I have close friends whose daughter graduated from Charlie Gibson's beloved Princeton. She graduated in 2007. She entered college in 2003, the same year the Iraq War began. And yet my friends say they were struck by the fact that the war was not mentioned at all in any way during her graduation ceremony. I suspect that was the case in most universities across the country. But during those very years, 2003 to 2007, 4,289 American young people were killed. Over that decade, more than 5,000 American children lost a parent or a sibling to combat, while the rest of the nation just carried on. This is why I have been and remain willing to take risk to cover the stories I cover. So have many of my brave colleagues, far too many of whom lost their lives or been badly wounded doing so. I still cannot be in a room with Bob Woodruff without tearing up. He is Miracle Bob. Each of us has a stake in the course and destiny of the nation. As journalists, we have an opportunity to help our country engage. I want people to know about the world. I want them to remember. I want people to feel. I want people to question. I want people to remember that right now in Walter Reed, there is a young man who was badly injured a few weeks ago who has absolutely no family around him. I want people to remember that in that same hospital is a young officer who just a few years ago stood with three other soldiers as groomsmen in a wedding. All four have now been wounded, but none would ever want to be seen as a victim. I want people to know about the young spouse I met this year, married to her husband just a few months before he went off to war and lost three limbs. When she first saw him in the hospital, he said, you do not have to stay with me. Her response, she looked him right in the eye and with a great deal of volume said, don't you ever friggin' say that again. And that was not the F word she actually used. <laughs> Today that couple is a model of inspiration and love and optimism. But I also want to question, and that is my duty. I have indeed seen heroes in the military, but after decades of listening to military leaders talking about zero tolerance for sexual assault, I want to know why Defense Secretary Leon Panetta acknowledged several months ago that close to 19,000 sexual assaults are still occurring in the military every year. I want to know why military-aged men killed during airstrikes in Afghanistan have not been counted as civilian deaths, even when targeters are not certain who those men are. And I want to know, after a decade of cultural training for our soldiers, why they are still accidentally burning Qurans. We can get those answers, and we can make people care and engaged. The former New York Times columnist Anthony Lewis, when talking about Fred Friendly, said, television is the most powerful medium for getting people to remember. And Fred found a way to use it like nobody else has. That is something we need to recommit to every day. I constantly hear the roar about television today, and sometimes I contribute to it. The dismay over the loss of viewers, over what some see as a loss of integrity, and over the direction the news business is taking. Fred Friendly heard the same decades ago, but he kept fighting. 
I don't have much patience for complaining without acting. We have to motivate our viewers, our listeners, our readers to keep watching, to keep learning, to keep remembering. We have to maintain the standards that we cherish. I really had no idea I wanted to be a journalist when I was young. I just fell into it. But I was passionate about learning, about reading. I was curious every single day when I woke up. And when I walked into one of my first newsrooms, I noticed a hole in the wall. A reporter had put his fist through it. Like Fred Friendly, though in a different way, that reporter had stood up for what he believed was right. I looked at that hole in the wall and thought, I think this profession will suit me quite well. <laughs> I do not advocate punching holes through walls, but I do believe we should make sure that we maintain a strong voice for the public, for informing the public. The news menu today is vast and varied. Admittedly, my stories fall in the vegetable category. I am rarely the dessert, but who among us wants to skip dessert, wants to learn only about the complexities of conflict, but not about the richness and quirkiness of our culture. There is a place for all of that among the meat and potatoes and green beans, as long as the same rules of integrity apply. The highest compliment I ever receive is not for scoops, although believe me, I love having scoops, it is when someone comes up to me and says, you got that story exactly right. You made me watch. In the coming years, I will have a particularly difficult challenge. I know that the war weariness is going to get worse, and it will get worse just as tens of thousands of veterans return home. It is estimated that one in five of those returning veterans will have mental health issues. That is 20% of the more than two million Americans who have served in these wars. Whether it is post-traumatic stress or traumatic brain injury, this country is going to have to welcome and care for those veterans and their families. And these mental health issues will be with us not just for the next few years, but for decades to come. Those are stories we need to tell and keep telling, and we have to follow those returning veterans who have so much to offer the civilian world and want to do their part to build bridges between the military and the rest of us. But we will also tell the inspiring stories of our changing world, of Arab Springs, of young men and women in Yemen who want to grow up to be doctors and teachers and hate what Al-Qaeda is doing to their country, and of young Americans who commit themselves to helping those who suffer abroad. I thank you all for this opportunity to talk about what I love and for giving me this meaningful award. I thank you, Ruth. I thank you, John. Thank you, Lee. And thank you to all my wonderful colleagues at ABC who have taught me so much. I am proud to stand among you. I feel very strongly that I owe you, that I owe the next generation of journalists the same mentoring that I have received from all of you and that I had the greatest mentor anyone could have, Jack McQuethy, who was lost far too soon. You young journalists will have a tougher fight, but I have no doubt that you will be inspired and find the stories that are waiting to be told. Thank you. Martha, thank you. Um, I hope you'll permit me to paraphrase what um, someone said to you. You got that message exactly right. Thank you so much. Um, once again, um, on behalf of uh, Dr. Leahy and Quinnipiac University, I want to thank you all for being here, for making this a truly memorable day, and uh, I bid you good afternoon.